Good morning and welcome to your online digital worship for Trinity United Church of Christ in Canton, Ohio for Sunday, January 30th, 2022. This morning we have a couple of announcements. We have a lot of exciting things happening in the next couple of months. The first is next Sunday we are going to be having communion so you can bring your own or you can have the communion that we will put in the little cup holders in the pews. But we will be all serving communion and honoring communion on the first Sunday of February. On the second Sunday of the month, we're going to be honoring our Scout Troop and PAC 4 with our Scout Sunday on February 13th. So please come on out to the service for that. They've been here at Trinity for well over 100 years, the longest relationship between any church and Scout Troop in the state of Ohio. So come on out and support our Scouts. Also, the day before, on Saturday, February 12th, uh, church member Kathy Ellison is going to be running a grief support group here at the church. So anyone is welcome to sign up for that, whether you recently lost somebody or you're grieving someone, a loved one from many years ago. You are welcome to come and sort of have some help and support with that grief group on Saturday, February 12th at the church. We also have Lent and Ash Wednesday coming up not far from now, and we are going to be having our traditional Wednesday evening Lent program. We're going to begin on Ash Wednesday, which is March 2nd this year. We are going to have a light soup and salad Lenten meal at 5.30 in our Faithful Blend Cafe, followed by an Ash Wednesday service at 6.30 in the sanctuary. So please come on out to that to begin our Lenten journey together. Then we will continue with a 5.30 meal and Lenten poetry service activity. We're going to do something a little bit different this year, and that will be at 5.30 every Wednesday all the way through till April 6th. We invite you all to come out and celebrate the journey of this most holy of seasons as we lead up to Easter. With that, let us now turn our hearts, our minds to the very purpose of our gathering wherever we may be with our call to worship. Great indeed is the mystery of our religion. God was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the word, taken up in glory. We gather in his presence. Let us worship him with pure hearts. Please join me in the spirit of prayer for our prayer of confession. Lord, we have come to see that our lives fall far short of your glory. Have mercy and forgive us. Lord, you have given your life for us and poured out your spirit. Yet we fail to return your love with all our heart. Have mercy and change us. Too often we are selfish and proud, ignoring you, Lord, and neglecting others. Have mercy and cleanse us. Lord, when we do not truly trust and obey you, we are overwhelmed by self-pity, fear, and worry. Have mercy and deliver us. In Christ, we are given a sure hope and secure love, yet we follow the false hopes and desires of this world. Lord, have mercy and forgive us. Hear now this good news and our assurance of pardon. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. As Jesus healed the afflicted and restored those who have died, he also forgives our sins and gives us new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. This morning's scripture comes from the fourth chapter of the gospel according to Luke. We are continuing our According to Luke series. This is verses 38 through 44. After leaving the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. Then he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Immediately she got up and began to serve them. As the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various kinds of disease, brought them to him. And he laid his hands on each of them and cured them. Demons also came out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them 
and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Messiah. At daybreak, he departed and went into a deserted place, and the crowds were looking for him, and when they reached him, they wanted to prevent him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he continued proclaiming the message in the synagogues of Judea. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning's sermon is entitled Healing. And I called it healing because the scripture talks about the obvious healing that Jesus does throughout the community. He's doing healing in this Scripture to close confidence to Simon Peter's mother-in-law, one of the disciples, but not just one of the disciples, one of his inner circle of Peter, James, and John, his mother-in-law is sick. And so we have here a really tender moment and a tender chapter of the Gospels where Jesus is doing this work that he's done for so many people, for strangers, for people all across the community, for the rich, for the poor, for the outcasts, for so many. And he's doing this now for essentially family. It's a touching moment. We also have Jesus healing many others immediately after Simon Peter's mother-in-law. It says that any who were sick or any people who had family members or friends that were sick brought them all to Jesus and he healed them all. Various kinds of diseases were brought to him. Demons came out of many. He was doing this work for so many people in the community after doing it for family. It is a touching moment indeed. But then we have an interesting part. For not only does this scripture celebrate the healing and the miracles that Jesus was able to do, he does all of this, and then he has to depart from them. He has to take a break. He has to take some Sabbath. He has to say, hang on. I can't just keep going and going and going. I need a break. I need some rest. And in that rest, in that moment when Jesus escapes the crowds, he disappears under the cover of darkness. At daybreak, he departed and went into a deserted place, we are told in Luke's gospel. In this moment, Jesus is showing us that even he needed healing from the healing himself. He needed to heal by resting and taking Sabbath and relaxing. So there are two modes of healing in this short scripture today, and that's one of the reasons I like it. There is so much to unpack, so much to dive into, so much wisdom to be gained from this brief passage. Because Jesus went to do his healing despite the demands that were placed on him by his followers, by all of those who were hearing about this miracle worker. Right before this passage, we are told that the news of his ministry spread quickly. So we know that Jesus' ministry is taking off. It's setting on fire among the people of Galilee. It's setting on fire among the rural and the poor and all of those who are desperate for healing and connection and to be made well. So this word is spreading. The crowds are coming. His reputation is getting ahead of him. And he tells everyone, Woe, for me to heal you, I have to heal myself and spend some time in prayer, in solitude, in quiet. Very important lessons for all of us in our lives, no matter what we do, whether we have young children at home clamoring for our attention, as I do, whether we are in the corporate business world with multi-million dollar business deals clamoring for our attention, whether we are working down the street 
at McDonald's, whether we have any job, whether we are pastors or teachers or nurses, whether we are working in the factory, whether we are working in the custodial offices, there are so many demands placed on all of us at all times, no matter what we find ourselves doing. This lesson of the importance of Sabbath, the importance of saying no, putting up some boundaries and healing ourselves before we can heal others and do the hard work that is asked of us, meet the demands of those around us, was a lesson that I myself need to learn over and over and over again. Now, I should have learned it from my first job out of college. I was 21 years old. I had just graduated from Bucknell University in Pennsylvania and moved across the country to Denver, Colorado. I was excited about starting a new life in a totally different part of the country. The job that I had was by an organization called the Colorado Public Interest Research Group, or COPERG for short. Now, COPERG had an interesting model for how they treated their new employees. COPERG was a nonprofit group, and they were a political organization that worked on political campaigns, not for any candidates in particular, but on issues and ballot initiatives. And they recruited heavily on college campuses across the country. So they were getting always a new crop of fresh-eyed 20, 21, 22-year-olds to do their work. They knew that we were idealistic at that moment, and they knew that they could probably exploit our labor just a wee bit, if not a whole heck of a lot. This is what I learned in the fall of 2000, 22 years ago, when I moved to Denver, Colorado. When I first moved there, I needed to find a place to live. And so I asked around, I was looking for an apartment, but the work had begun and they needed me in the office 10 hours a day, so I didn't have time to find a place to live. One of the other employees said, well, don't worry, you can just crash on my couch in the basement next to the furnace. Not an ideal place to be, but at least I had a place to lay my head at night. So I laid there at night after working 10 hours a day. I was exhausted, and the furnace noises kept me up. And I did this for about a week or so, and I felt, you know, <laughs> this isn't working out so well. I really need to find my own place. So I told my colleague, hey, I actually need to take a little time to go find a place where I can live. And she looked at me and said, well, what's wrong with the couch in my basement? I said, it's not working out. I can't get rest. I can't find any Sabbath. I'm working so hard here all day and not sleeping at night. I'm really burning out. She kind of scratched her head and didn't even understand how anyone could have a problem with this situation, but let me have a day to find an apartment. As I said, I wasn't making much of a living wage, so I lived in pretty much a horrible, squalid apartment, but we won't tell that story just yet. Suffice it to say, it was better than the basement couch, but not a whole lot. You see, Koperg had this belief that if we just worked harder, if they just squeezed a little more blood from these stones of these young kids, then they could accomplish their goals. And we were working on a ballot initiative, a responsible growth initiative, because development was going a little bit out of control in the Denver area 22 years ago. And so the organization was sponsoring a ballot initiative to put growth boundaries around where you could develop and couldn't to save open space, to save land, to sort of manage the growth. And that was our initiative. So they worked us 50, 60 hours a week throughout the entire fall of the campaign. I moved there in August, and the election was in November. And we worked, and we worked, and as the time got closer to the election, they just kept telling us, we will win this thing if you just give us more hours. If you can just work a little harder, if you can just have a little more coffee and don't worry about sleeping, you're young, you'll be fine. And so we did. It was so bad that I found myself waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning on election day in the freezing cold and trying to tape one more yard sign to the telephone poles down the street from the polling places across the city of Denver. My hands were so numb from the freezing cold, I couldn't even, and the tape wasn't sticking, couldn't make any of it work. But I just kept saying, if I just do one more thing, we will win this thing. The reward for all of our efforts was 30% of the vote. 30 to 70, we lost horribly. It was a miserable experience, my first political campaign, and it was a resounding loss. I felt devastated, but at least I said the next day, I can sleep now. 
because my boss had said, don't worry, the day after election day, I don't want to see any of you. You're working so hard, you should take some time off. So the next day, I slept in and I felt great until I got a call from my boss saying, where are you? We're all here at the office. I said, wait, hey, hey, this was the deal. We worked ourselves to death so the day after election day, we could at least have some rest. And she said, oh, well, no, I didn't really mean that. I was just a joke. I expect to see you here in 30 minutes. I said, I'm sorry, I'm too tired, I can't come in. My job didn't last much longer than that. That was the end of my employment with Coper because I didn't show up on a day that was promised to me after an incredible, difficult few months of overworking as a rest and Sabbath. Luckily, I had a little money, tiny bit of money saved up, and I found another job about six weeks later, which was wonderful. However, the point of the story is I was told, I was sold to this idea that if I just worked a little harder, we would accomplish our goal, and that was false. That was wrong. The higher-ups knew that we were no, in no way, shape, or form going to win this thing. But they kept telling us that on the backs of our labor, on the exploitation of these young kids, we would just get there, and we didn't. Not only did I sleep most of that next day after Election Day, I ended up getting sick, and I ended up having a pretty miserable time in the weeks to come. I was exhausted. I was overworked. I had not believed that I deserved a little healing and Sabbath because I was trying to heal the world and the environment and save Colorado. Now, this lesson is the lesson that is truly echoed here by Jesus when he has to take a moment despite the demands and the expectations of all the people around him for the healing and the miracles that they were so desperate for that he was doing and providing this incredible ministry. He still had to take a breath and say no. Right now, I need to go over here and I need a moment to myself. And so I say all this, that to invite everyone, no matter where you are or what you are doing, we are in the rat race of a technologically fast-paced society and every one of us could use to hear that lesson that sometimes we have to say no on the demands placed around us so that we can heal ourselves before we help anybody else. That's a lesson from today's scripture. And I think it's a lesson that we all could take to heart. It is okay to do some self-care. It is okay to set up boundaries. It is okay to say no. We can't do it all. And sometimes when we think, if I just put in a little more effort and just skip this amount of sleep and just don't do this for myself, that usually doesn't work out very well. So I invite us all to take time to discern when to say yes, when to say no, to discern the ways that we can help heal ourselves so we can help others before we say yes to everything that comes across our plates, every demand by those around us. Take a moment, take a breath, and think about whether or not you have the energy or the time to do whatever it is. I promise you, you will be happier, healthier, and the interesting thing is you'll be able to do better for the people who are asking and clamoring for your help when you can do it well instead of out of frustration, out of anger, out of annoyance and exhaustion. That exhaustion doesn't serve anyone. And yes, I know I am preaching to myself with two young kids at home and two churches to take care of in our family, but I'm sure that I am not alone in this feeling in this world right now. So my prayer, my hope for us all, that we can learn to say no, put up some boundaries, and take that Sabbath healing that Jesus modeled for us, and we take that into our hearts and live it out in our lives. Amen. Now we're called to offer just a portion of the gifts that God so freely gives to us all. Back to the missions and ministries of this church. Please give generously. You can click on the link in the video. You can mail in your offerings, your envelopes. You can drop them off here at the front office. No matter how you give, we say thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. Help us to start 
2022 off right and strong as we go forward and try to be the people of God right here in Canton, Ohio. Thank you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you until we meet again. May you go into this world remembering that it is okay to take a breath, to say no, to put up some boundaries, and to heal yourself before you try to help everybody else. Amen.